Hello and welcome to Global Pulpit, where the world is our parish. I'm Camille Magdaly from the Ministry of Teach All Nations. Our tagline is Empowering Through Word and Spirit. And the goal of Global Pulpit is disarmingly simple. We want to give you God's unchanging word for changing times. So I thank you in advance for your company as we have a great adventure in the Word of God. Well, I want to speak on what is possibly the most beloved piece of prose in the English language. This piece of prose is recited even at secular funerals. It's that beloved. But this piece of prose is not just a mere product of human invention. It's the Word of God. Indeed, hopefully you might guess what it is. The 23rd Psalm. It's about God being the Great Shepherd. And it was written by a pretty good shepherd himself, and that's David. It is a masterful piece, particularly when read in the authorized King James Version. So I want to read the psalm to you with the conviction that we need its timeless principles today more than even David needed them 3,000 years ago. If you have a Bible, turn with me to the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is an amazing revelation of God and from God. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, I know most of you have no experience with sheep or shepherds, except to have lamb chops or a roast on a Sunday, but the fact is the shepherd has an invaluable role. They certainly were very common in the days of the Bible, and they still are, of course, today. But what does a shepherd actually do, and how does God fit into the metaphor of being the shepherd? Good question. So let's begin to unpack the 23rd Psalm. What I see this Psalm telling us is God is offering an amazing service to those that will come to Him and trust Him with all of their heart all of the time. This is not for casual inquirers. This is not for those who are skeptical and scornful. These are for people who are hungry for the Word, and thirsty for the Spirit, even before they come to a saving knowledge of Christ. So what does the shepherd do for the sheep that God does for his people who follow him? I want to suggest five things right here that the shepherd does. First of all, the shepherd is a leader. He leads the sheep. He knows where to go. They don't. So they would be very wise to follow him. He leads. What else does the shepherd do? He feeds. He makes sure that the sheep have not only pasture to graze in, but water to drink. He leads. He feeds. What else does he do? Well, in addition to his leading, he guides. Now, they might seem like the same thing, but remember, a guide doesn't necessarily always lead in the strict sense of the word. The guide basically gives guidance. Go this way, do this, do that. Leading is, in my sense, more of the broad stroke. The Lord guides his people. In fact, we never refer to the Lord as a leader because he's so much higher. He is Lord. So he leads, he feeds, he guides. But what else does the shepherd do that God also does? We learn that he provides what does he provide? He provides whatever you need. This is found in the very first verse of this psalm. 
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Very good point. But there is more. He provides the pasture, the water, and, of course, the protection, which is the fifth thing. Now, sheep are very vulnerable. They're vulnerable to getting lost. They're vulnerable to being attacked by predators. They are absolutely defenseless if and when they are attacked. The shepherd comes in to protect them from the wolves, from starvation, from dying of thirst, and from any other thing that might harm them. In some ways, the relationship between the shepherd and the sheep is almost familial. It's like the shepherd can be a father or a mother figure, because there are female shepherds. I actually met a female shepherd in the United Kingdom. I'm living in a town, but yet she lives near the town, and that's her full-time job, being a shepherd. She's also a Christian, and of course, she could capably make many analogies about the 23rd Psalm. So here we have it. Just like the shepherd leads, feeds, guides, provides, and protects, Almighty God does precisely the same. And, of course, the metaphor of the shepherd will be co-opted, or applied is a better term, by Jesus Christ himself. If we have time, we'll explore what he had to say on this matter. But you can read more in the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John. Jesus is talking about the shepherd, and he's talking about himself, and he goes as far as to say, I am the good shepherd. And that's in John 10, verse 14. So let's begin to go through the 23rd Psalm, beginning with the first verse, the first of six. It begins, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Some modern translations put it, The Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. But please remember, first of all, he's the Lord. He is the one and only. The Bible testifies through the Holy Spirit revelation that God of the Bible is the only God out there. There's no one else. He is singular. He's the one and only. And so he is the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. But there's something very interesting. is the personal pronoun. The Lord is my shepherd. I chose to follow him, but before I chose to follow him, he chose me. It always is God first, by the way. We didn't just wake up and decide to chase an unknowing, reluctant deity. No, we were chosen by God, and we wisely said yes to his invitation. So he's no longer just God, but my God. No longer the Lord, but my Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. Powerful metaphor, as we've seen, to lead, feed, guide, provide, and protect. And because the Lord is your shepherd, you have everything you need. Now, of course, another metaphor or analogy for the Lord is the Heavenly Father. And just like a good, decent father takes care of his children, similar to the shepherd, leading, feeding, guiding, providing, protecting, so God does for his children. It is incredibly important that we get it into our heads that God is not to be a part-time casual activity or that the service of God is reserved for Sundays and special holidays. If that is your experience at the moment, you will not understand, or shall we say, not receive the blessing of the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The lifestyle of a faith-filled, spirit-filled, Bible-believing, born-again Christian is one of constant walking with, and yes, dependence on the living God. That is the healthiest place you can be. Basically saying, I need God, I want God, and I'm following Him. So He is your shepherd. Whatever you need, He will provide. There are numerous promises in the Bible of God taking care of his people. Probably one of the best is Matthew 6.33, part of the Sermon on the Mount, which Jesus Christ himself enunciated. He says, don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. 
Your heavenly Father knows you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, the eating, the drinking, the clothing, and everything else, God will provide. I've actually staked my life on Matthew 6.33, living by faith, traveling the world, doing God's ministry, and so on. And I can say God does provide for his people. If you look to him, he will do it. And I've never had to beg and plead to humans to be taken care of. God is the good shepherd. Trust me on this. I have, again, done ministry for years, and God has always been, as it were, ready to help me whenever I need. I've raised a family, educated them, paid mortgages, done all this, because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Verse 2. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. That's an interesting phrase. He takes the sheep to where they need to go. He makes the sheep do what they need to do. But, frankly, who wouldn't want to rest, have a day off, sleep in, or what have you? In other words, God takes us to the green pasture and he causes us to rest, to lie down. Because there's something in us, and it's always been the case with humans, not just in modern frenetic times, that we are wound up like a top and we just go, 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 and it, sometimes God has to make you rest. And not just anywhere, in the green pastures, which is where, of course, you will get your nourishment. He'll lead you to the still waters because you need not just rest, you need peace and inner well-being and serenity. He can give all that. Let me tell you, he is the God of peace. Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. So if you're needing peace now, you can have it now, despite all the complications in life, because the Good Shepherd is a peacemaker. It says in Isaiah 26 verse 3 that you shall keep them in perfect peace. This is talking to God whose mind is stayed on you, because he, he, he trusts in you. I'm paraphrasing a little, I could quote it, but the fact is, God will give you perfect peace. You just have to focus on the Good Shepherd. In verse 3, it says, He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. He doesn't just lead you to rest. He leads you to restoration. If we've been living a hard life, a life estranged from God, a life in the world. Let me tell you, life in the world is no picnic. It's not glamorous like it's fun to be. I've never seen anyone live the full worldly life, and I think, boy, I'd love to live that kind of life. No way. Because what you see is not always what you get. And I've even heard famous, I mean, so famous you would know the names, rich people, famous people, who said, the riches are there, the fame is there, and they mean nothing. What we need is not that which is external but internal. We need restored souls. Jesus Christ is the soul doctor. <laughs> he is the one who pours in the oil and wine and massages with the balm of Gilead. He will restore your soul. That's why we believe to the saving of the soul. Praise God. He leads you in the paths of righteousness. By the way, we need righteousness in order to connect with God. If we try our own righteousness, the book of Isaiah tells us that our righteousness is at best filthy rags. We need Christ's sinless, perfect righteousness. And the good news, friends, according to Philippians chapter 3, is that if you believe Jesus and follow him, he will download his righteousness into you, Therefore, you can approach a holy God in full confidence and assurance of faith. He leads you in the paths of righteousness. It's like Christ, the Good Shepherd, is coaching us, guiding us, leading us into righteous living. And righteous living is wonderful living. Don't think you're going to miss out on life's best and you'll never have fun again living a righteous life before God. Not so. You will live a perfectly wonderful life. When you're in Him, He leads you in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake, the highest name above all names. Here's a good one, verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. 
for thou art with me. David was very familiar with the valley of the shadow of death, even before he became in Saul's crosshairs and was pursued up and down the Judean mountains by the deranged monarch. Oh no, David knew about the valley of the shadow of death as a shepherd, a young man, because the river valleys east of Bethlehem led to the rift valley, which was below sea level, and to the Dead Sea. Those valleys are narrow at the bottom with high walls, and the sun sets so quickly. One moment you're in the sunlight, next moment you're in the dark. In that wilderness, it may look empty and forlorn, but there is plenty living out there. Not so much people, although there's a few of them as well, but there used to be lions and bears in David's day, not now. Scorpions, venomous creatures, serpents, Lord knows what else. David faced all that, and yet he was not afraid. What was the basis of his fearlessness? Well, the simple. God is with him. When God is with you and for you, nothing and no one can be against you. It is like the young boy at school, and there's a schoolyard bully who menaces him every recess. He doesn't even want to eat his lunch. He doesn't want to go play because the bully will be waiting. But when the big brother comes to the school, that young boy can play to his heart's content. His appetite returns. No problem, because the big brother is more than a match for the bully. I will fear no evil because you are with me, said the psalmist. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. They represent authority. They can represent correction and guidance. They represent God is with you. Here's a good one, the fifth verse. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Friends, after we come to Christ and are being led in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake, there is more work God wants to do. He wants just as salvation is a gift to us sinners, he wants to bless us with the gift of the Holy Spirit, as now we are believers. And to me, this is a perfect analogy of the baptism and fullness of the Holy Spirit. He takes us to the banqueting table in the presence of enemies. He anoints our head with oil. That's, to me, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. An oil represents the anointing. And it says, our cup runneth over. You see, we just want a drink. Jesus says, come to me and drink. John chapter 7, 37 to 39. Come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Praise God for that. Rivers of living water. So we just wanted a mouthful. He gives us rivers instead. Our cup runs over. It's out of the overflow that we have the heavenly language. It's out of the overflow that we have the spiritual gifts, nine spiritual gifts mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, and nine fruit of the Spirit mentioned in Galatians chapter 5. Praise God, we need the Holy Spirit like we need the Good Shepherd. Finally, verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I heard a famous Australian, I won't say who, a good man, famous person, and he made an interesting thing. He had very, very high profile in the country. But he said, I never chased after the opportunity. The opportunity came to me. I just did my duty, whatever it was at the time. I really feel there's a divine principle here. Most people chase after other people or they chase opportunity. I want to tell you something far better. Pursue the shepherd. If you're going to chase anyone, chase him. Because when you follow with all of your heart, all of the time, the Good Shepherd, who will lead, feed, guide, provide, and protect you, goodness and mercy shall follow you. Opportunity shall follow you. Blessing will follow you. Or as Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Well, yes, let's follow Christ, let's follow Paul. And all the things we need will come to us. When I reflect on my own life, my biggest breakthroughs 
happened while I was pursuing God. I wasn't looking for opportunity. I was looking for the shepherd, and the opportunity opened up. And of course, be wise and seize the opportunity. The train doesn't stay at the platform indefinitely waiting for you to make up your mind. If it's time to get on that train of opportunity that God has provided, then friends, do it. Let me close with this analogy. We can either treat Jesus Christ as a spare tire in the boot or trunk of the car to use in an emergency. What a terrible way to live, and yet, unfortunately, that is a mindset and lifestyle of many. Or we can treat Jesus Christ as not the spare tire. He is the car. He is the driver. He is the road signs. He is the road. He is the finish line. He is the final destination. He is the prize. He's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He is the good shepherd. Finally, let me quote to you from John chapter 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Do you know his voice? If you don't know his voice, then follow him. You'll not only hear his voice, you'll hear your name. Let me lead you in prayer. Father, thank you for the 23rd Psalm. It continues to bless today as it has for the last 3,000 years. I pray for all that hear this message, that they will treat Jesus as the Good Shepherd, that Jesus is worth following with a whole heart at all times. Jesus will never let us down. Jesus will take us to the green pastures, the still waters, restore our soul, lead us in the paths of righteousness, be with us in the valley of the shadow of death, be with us at the table, anoint our head with over oil, our cup will run over, and yes, we get goodness and mercy and every good and perfect gift as we say yes to Christ as Savior and yes to Christ as Lord. In his wonderful name we pray, amen. Thank you for joining me. I enjoyed spending this time with you on the 23rd Psalm. If you like this message, please click the like button, the share button, the subscribe button, and look forward to your company again next time at Global Pulpit as we continue to feed on God's unchanging word for changing times.